taking the audio off. Welcome to Outward's Journey and Partners in Pride Wellness Center live Zoom and Facebook event. I want to assure everyone on Zoom and Facebook that the audience in the Pride Wellness Center is properly socially distanced and they are wearing masks. We from Outward's Journey are really excited about the event because we are celebrating our first live event since March. But more important, we are celebrating the beginning of Partners in Pride Wellness Center. To speak more about Partners in Pride Wellness Center, I will introduce Jamie Pagano, the founder. Jamie, would you please come up? Thank you. Sign your baby. Hi, I'm Jamie Pagano, and uh, I use he, him pronouns. Um, yeah, so actually, I've, I've been in practice for the last four years, but we're going under Transmogrify Counseling Services. And for those of you who don't know what Transmogrify means, it's a magical or grotesque transformation, which I think is describes a lot of uh, the process of therapy, but also a large part of what our focus is, which is working with trans and gender, non-conforming and non-binary adolescents and young adults. And so um, we are expanding our services. Um, we are hoping to incorporate medical and psychiatric services. We offer outpatient counseling. And um, yes, yeah, so we're, we're hoping to, we, have, we also have access to the LGBT clothing closet, which is, um, is going to be housed in our in our new space. So. Yeah. So, thank you all for coming, and we are wearing masks, but just not when we're up here. Not so. when we're up here. <laughs> so. All right. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. A little bit more about Outward's Journey. Outward's Journey holds monthly storytelling events, which provides a supportive environment, free from pressure and judgment for individuals who identify as allies of LGBTQ community. The stories transform painful events from the past into powerful, inspiring, and often hilarious monologues of resilience and survival. These stories have the power to change and rebuild lives to further their journey to wholeness. We have a website that I'd like to tell you about it. it's outwards, O U T W O R D S. Not words, it's words, W O R E D S dot org. You can visit our website. You can also go to the website and let us know if you have a personal story or experience that you would like to tell in story form with us. What do you do when you find your child is gay, lesbian, or bisexual? Some parents are able to take the news in stride, but some go through some, something similar to a grieving process with the accompanying shock, denial, anger, and guilt and sense of loss. Some parents feel as they have lost their child, and they haven't. Your child is the same as he or she was yesterday. The only thing that you have lost is the image of what you had of your child. That loss can be very difficult, but the image can change happily be replaced with a new and clearer understanding of your child. The reason I say this is our, our first storytellers, Joe, and Joe Strauss and his wife, Sue Bulba Strauss, have been married for 35 years. They have two boys. One is gay, one is straight, and they love them equally. Joe and Sue are strong advocates of the LGBTQ plus community and hope to help parents in their own upcoming. Joe and Sue 
will each share their individual stories of how their gay son impacted their lives and their journey of transformation. Joan. Good evening and welcome. My name is Joe and I will be your waiter this evening. If there's anything I can get you, please don't hesitate to ask. As we were driving, the interstate mile marker read 23 miles to Ann Arbor. The emotions and the tears have already started to surface. I was surprised the feelings came so early. We were approaching our son's new home, preparing to drop off our first son at college. My Ben. It was the start of a new chapter in his life, a journey for him that was well deserved. I was a proud father that freshman year. Football games at the big house, the vintage ice arena, watching Ben compete as an NCAA gymnast, the Big Ten Conference. In the months that followed, we made a return visit to experience the excitement that college life had on campus. After a day of embracing all that this campus had to offer, we, our entire family, took Ben out to dinner at Grazzi, an Italian restaurant in Ann Arbor. My wife and I and our two boys won a new proud Wolverine. We were greeted at our table by our waiter, who was very demonstrative, flamboyant in his demeanor. My father, if he were still here, would have said he was light in his loafers. My youngest son chuckled, and I followed in laughter. We stigmatized him our waiter with a gay sounding voice. As, as all of this transpired, I looked over and I saw Ben as he gazed down toward the linen tablecloth in silence. The years seemed to fly by. In Ben's senior year, he found the courage to come out to my wife, his mother, that he was a gay man. This seemed as no surprise to me, because it's quite possible that with that chuckle and laughter, years ago at that waiter, I failed to earn Ben's trust and be viewed as safe space for him. Through Ben's coming out, he shared with us his story of growing up and his fear of speaking. He was self-conscious of the way he sounded, fearing that others could tell he was gay merely by the sound of his voice. It is true, in 62% of the cases, listeners identified the sexual orientation of men correctly by the sound of their more effeminate voice. Hmm, effeminate, more typical of a woman, unmanly, that evening at Grazi, the actions of my father, the actions and the words of my father before me, and what my youngest son witnessed 
of my behavior have taught me it's the slightest gestures or the derogatory comments that hurt the most. It was an opportunity that I failed to recognize to change the course, to make it stop there with me and set an example in front of my wife and my two boys. That night at Grazi, the only one at our table, including our waiter, that was unmanly was me. I have, I have always been tender hearted. I am tender hearted and I knew better. That evening was my moment to stop the cycle of systemic and unconscious bias towards the LGBTQ plus community and I missed it. So this evening, as I bear witness, this serves as my amends. To amend my ways, to change for the better. And I often reflect on how far I have already come. I am proud to tell you, Ben, that I unconditionally accept and love everything about you. Your gentleness, your sensitivity, your humor, your being. Ben recently shared with me, quote, that while I was growing up, I was crippled by my voice, but today it serves as my strength. Now, my Ben is a doctor, a radiologist at the University of Chicago, working with women and breast radiology. Once he viewed his voice as crippling, now he sees his voice as a gift of comfort. It, it, is, it is my son that has made me a, be, a, better, a better man. And as I march, it is for all the bends out there to show the support and the love of a father yours and mine who are proud of who you have become. It goes so much further than this story for me. It's black and brown, all races, creeds, and genders. A black individual, I celebrate the color of their skin. I give nothing but respect to a woman wearing a hijab, a Sikh gentleman, or the turban I view as safe space. A Latino or Native American deserves my utmost display of being polite, respectful, and courteous. When I see a Jewish man donning a kippah, or the many others that are unlike me, I seek to learn and embrace our differences. You see, I recognize I was not born with any bias. Many I have learned over a lifetime, and many are difficult to distance myself from. But for me, I have made a decision that it stops right here, right now. Because for me, I have chosen to love. Thank you, Jim. Oh, I should have gone first. <laughs>
So everybody has those moments that turn your life upside down. And that moment came for me about 10 years ago when I was in Ann Arbor um, at Zingerman's Deli with my son who was a senior at University of Michigan. But before uh, I get to that, let me back up a little bit and tell you how I got to that moment. It was actually a couple years before that. I had gone up to Minnesota, where I'm from, and one of my really, really good friends who I share everything with, um, she and I were kayaking. And out of the blue, she says, did you ever wonder if Ben's gay? I kind of got silent. And she said, are you mad? And I said, uh, well, how would you like it if I asked you if Natalia, her, her daughter, was gay? Would you be okay with that? And she said, wow, I'm, I'm kind of surprised at your reaction. And um, I said, why would you say that? And she says, well, because of the things he's into. I mean, he loves to sing and dance. He's doing gymnastics. And oh yeah, it's been 22 years and he still hasn't dated. And I honestly had never given that a thought. I mean, in my mind, he was just so busy. I mean, he had pre-med he was working on and five hours of gymnastics a day and all day on the weekends. For me, it, it just made sense that he was just too busy. And besides, Ben and I were tight. I mean, we were close. He, he would have told me, right? So I started going into some deep reflection mode and I thought, wow. And um, I got home and Joe says, how was the trip? And I said, good. I said, uh, guess what Nancy asked me? I said, she asked me whether or not I thought Ben was gay. And Joe, all nonchalant, says, yeah, I've thought of that all along. I'm like, what? Without, without talking that over with me? I was stunned. He was just so calm about it all. And he said, what difference does it make? Hmm. What difference did it make? And I started to thinking about all the, all the things I had imagined for him. I started thinking about what if people ridicule him or hurt him or put him down? I mean, life's hard enough. And then selfishly, for me to have to let go of the things that I had imagined for him and for me. I mean, I'm accepting of gays. I have nothing against gays. I have a ton of friends and nieces and nephews and, and I love them. And it's a little different when it's your own kid. So I started asking those friends for some advice and I said, you know, should I go and ask them, like, directly? What if I'm wrong? You know, what do I do? And, and the advice I got was, he'll come to you. you now, let him, let him come to you on his own time, on his own terms. So I waited, and I observed, and I hinted, and I watched. <laughs> and then I started noticing as I watched closer, is he really happy? He seemed like he was kind of hurting. 
I started to really struggle with it. And I said, I, you know, I wonder, should I, should I just come out and ask him? And what if I'm wrong? What if I hurt him? And I was really struggling. We went on for two years like this. My, my chance finally came in the spring of Ben's senior year. I remember it being a beautiful day. I had to drop off a car for him. And so what I was going to do is drop off a car and fly home. I had just enough time to grab a bite. So there we decided to go to Zingerman's. We're out on the sidewalk in front. It's a bustling, busy day. Everybody's out and about. And Ben and I are just sitting there enjoying ourselves and talking and chatting and eating. And he starts talking to me about this woman that he had just met. I'm like, oh, are you interested? Maybe in dating her? And right there, his gaze went down immediately. And I instinctively knew at that very moment, that gaze down, like there it was, plain as day, plain as day. I just knew it. And I said to him right away, I just, I just blurted it out as I often do. Ben, are you, are you struggling with, with what Evan's going through? Like I couldn't even say, are you gay? I, I cloaked it, made it softer somehow. And he started shaking his head no. But his body betrayed him. And the tears just started streaming down his face. And he's still shaking his head no. And I'm like. <laughs> and then he, he started shaking his head. And through the tears, I'll never forget. Um, I'll never forget what he uttered through his tears, he says, Mom, just don't hate me. Don't hate me. I'm like, thank you. I just flew out of the chair. I wrapped my arms around him and I just held him. And, you know, we're, we're bawling our heads off crying, holding each other right in front of the Zingermans. Everybody's walking by, crying for the whole world to see, but we didn't care. It was just our moment, you know, and I had so much, like, just coming at me. It was, uh, it was kind of almost surreal, like, the feeling that just came at me, but I thought, you know what? I can figure it out later. I'll grow into it. I'll understand it later. Right now, what he needs is my love. Without a doubt. That's all he needs to feel right now, my love. So we finish crying and we make it to our car and I have to go to the airport even though I want to stay for a day or a week or I just want to talk to him all about it and but I had to leave. And I'm at the airport and I'm hugging him goodbye. And I said, I gotta just tell you a quick little story, Ben. I said, on the day that you were born, Ben was my first, I hardly even held a baby, but the day he was born, I remember holding him in my arms. I'll never forget this little, little thing looking up at me into my eyes and I, I remember, it's 30, 32 years now, but I remember exactly, I whispered to him and I said, I never, I never want you to know the hurt that this world can bring. It was just kind of almost my prayer for him. And now I'm looking in the eyes of my 22 year old gay son and I said, Ben, I can't keep you from feeling the world's hurt, but I can promise I'll be there every step of the way. It was, it was like, it, like I had opened the door for a caged bird. It was like he kind of gingerly came out, 
looked around and kind of tested tested it. You know, are people going to accept me? What's it going to be like out there? And and then and then he took off and he flew. He really flew. I mean, he, he's downtown Chicago, finishing up his residency. He's living in a condo just outside of Boys Town. He's he's got a longtime partner. He is flourishing and he's finding himself and being himself. It's just wonderful. It's just wonderful to watch unfold. And, and my mission, my mission is to never let Ben live another moment with, the, with doubting my love. I mean, he had 10 years of since middle school going through that all by himself without me. I think the only one that he dared talk to was our dog. Yep. Told their dog his secrets and, and uh, so he was very, very alone. And he said to me, mom, you know, if you wouldn't have come out and asked me, I wouldn't have told you. He said, too much to lose. So that's the hardest part for me is that he was so alone, but not anymore, not anymore. I want to shout my love from, for Ben from the rooftops. And it's why I try to help parents who are kind of learning to come out. It's why I work with younger kids who really struggle with the whole scene the whole loss, the trust issue. You know, it's why I march at pride parades for those that are along the side of the parade, not feeling loved. And it's why I speak tonight. Because I love my Ben and I want you guys to love the bends of your life. And trust me when I say it'll really turn your world right side up. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Sue. You know, a lot of times we don't look at, um, thank you. We don't look at the history of the LGBTQ community, plus community. And there are a lot of people besides the celebrities that we see on the television, but there are a lot of people that have contributed to society. And I'm going to read a short bio of one person who did. His name is Dr. Harry Benjamin. He was a medical doctor now best remembered for pioneering work with transsexuals. Benjamin was born in Berlin in 1885. While still at university, a university student, his interest in the science of sexuality led to a friendship with Magnus Hirschfeld the leader of the homosexual emancipation movement and founding director of the Institute of Sexual Science. Dr. Benjamin accompanied Hirschfeld on visits to homosexual and transgender bars in Berlin when Hirschfeld was researching and writing the first book length treatment of transgender phenomena published in 1910. Benjamin completed his medical studies in 1912 and came to the United States in 1913 to work as a doctor on a tuberculosis research project. By the 1940s, Benjamin was spending his summers in San Francisco and it was there in 1949 
that he first took a professional interest in helping a transsexual patient. At that time, doctors in the United States refused to administer hormones or perform genitalia reconstruction surgery on transgendered people who desired this procedure. Benjamin was instrumental in bringing the less moralizing perspective of the German sexology tradition to bear on transgender issues in the United States. In the early 1950s, especially after Christine Jurgensen transsexual surgery in Denmark made headlines around the world in 1952, Dr. Benjamin found himself at the center of medical discussions about transsexuality. Dr. Benjamin did more than any other individual to bring that word into widespread public use. Privately, Dr. Benjamin prescribed hormones for dozens, if not hundreds, of early transsexuals and helped arrange genitalia surgery for a select few. By 1996, the transsexual phenomenon, Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin, was just regarded as the world's most prominent expert on the subject. Benjamin's model for dealing with transgender people is still the basic paradigm for transsexual medical care in honor of, and in honor of his pioneering contributions to the field, the Association of Medical and Psycho Psychotherapeutic Professionals who regulate access to transgender health care is known as the Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association. Dr. Benjamin maintained an active personal and professional life until the early 1980s. Dr. Benjamin Harry died in New York in 1986 at the age of 101. For some children and teenagers in the cultures, their gender of all cultures, their gender identity is different from the sex they were given at birth. These children do well with support from parents, family, and the community. Our next storyteller shares how her child came to her with gender identity issues and how she walked her child and herself through it. Maureen Muldoon is a life coach that has supported nationally recognized musicians, actors, and athletes to achieve their personal and professional goals. She is an award-winning actress her work has been featured on HBO, Fox TV, CBS, Parade, Pop Sugar, The Goodman Project, Risk, Actors Access, and She Writes Press. Among other things, Maureen is an author, artist, and a licensed spiritual practitioner. Would you please welcome Maureen Mogu? Nice to be here with everyone. Gosh, Ben's a lucky, a lucky boy to have you guys as parents. That was beautiful. And Zimmerman's, best babka in the world. If you haven't been there, that's good stuff. Um, turns out I can't see my story in this light. Would you like to I borrow certainly this? Would. There you go. Oh Just gosh. clip it on the stand. You are a gentleman. Thank, Thank Joe you. for that. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All righty. So my 13-year-old daughter posted a sign on her bedroom wall that says, a pansexual transgender lives here. And when I see it, I think, a pansexual transgender lives here? 
and I think to myself, I better Google that shit. <laughs> and so I do. And it turns out that pansexual people identify as being able to spiritually, physically, emotionally love all, all genders. And I think that's a lot of love. And so I um, don't have to Google the word transgender because I know that one. You know, that's one of the seven words that our president has banned the CDC from using. And then suddenly I think, oh, I mean, if he's going to ban the word, like, what will he do to the child? And, and then I think, oh, shit, no, I know what he'll do to the child because I have that, that memory of the, the kids and the borders and the, the cages. And I start shaking my head like an edge sketch and I sit on my couch and I think to myself, uh, hey, you know, maybe this is just a phase, right? You know, the kids are just hopscotching from this to that these days and this maybe it's... And I think, God, why did I think it's, when, why would I, I mean, do I want this to be a phase? I mean, do I secretly, not so secretly, not want my child to be transgender? And then I think maybe, maybe she's just a lesbian. <laughs> and I know I shouldn't say just a lesbian. I know that's on me. I know that's bad. I shouldn't have a hierarchy of appropriate lifestyles. I know that. But lesbians are so, I mean, everybody loves lesbians, right? I mean, lesbians are so funny, right? I mean, there's Ellen and there's Wanda Sykes and there's Jane Lynch, right? <laughs> she's hysterical. And uh, Lily Tomlin and, and I think, are all lesbians like 50 year old comedians? And then I realized, no, 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 that's not true because I've met some res lesbians who are not funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've let, met some lesbians who are totally not funny. I was a lesbian once. Um, I wasn't really, a, I, I kind of, I failed at lesbianism to be truthful with you. I just failed at it, you know? I mean, I kissed a girl and um, I liked it, but, um, I just wasn't, um, I mean, when it came right down to it, you know, when it came right down to it, I, um, I'm not, I, uh, I'm not a veg, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a vegetarian, as it turns out, you know, I, um, it was not, it was like feeding a finicky kid bad broccoli, I was like, oh, mm, mm, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm fine, I'm full, so that didn't work out very well for me, <clears throat> or her, <laughs> Uh, so, and it's not that I have anything against vaginas. I mean, I love vaginas, just to be clear, set the record straight there. I love vagina. I mean, I love my vagina is what I mean to say. When I first discovered my vagina, it was like the Holy Grail, you know? I mean, finding it was like, oh, <laughs> it was like the original fidget spinner, you know, playing with it helped me with my anxiety. Yeah. So as a child, I would just kind of hump my way around the living room and, um, and it, it's not just the pleasure that my vagina has given me, but the fact that um, this vortex of awesomeness has actually birthed forth four children. Yeah, four illegal aliens have crossed through this border, and um, they do look like aliens. I, I don't know, I can't speak for Ben's parents, but my kids were creepy when they were born. I mean, total aliens, you know, don't let anyone fool you. Um, so I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm thinking about creepy-looking babies and funny lesbians, and... I'm wondering why I'm not walking through the door and speaking with my child. And I realize it's just because I'm really not ready, you know? Because I know that once I walk through the door, uh, well, everything will change. And uh, I'm kind of uncomfortable with change. I mean, who isn't? And I think about humping the couch for old time's sakes, but um, I pass and <clears throat> I decide to go ahead and knock on her door. And I walk into her room and she's 14 years old and she's, she's teeny for her age and she's sitting on her bed and she's surrounded by her rocks and her crystals and her artwork and she smiles at me and I smile and I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to say. So I just say, um, uh, what does, uh, what does pansexual mean, even though I've already looked it up? And she smiles at me and she said, oh, 
um, mom, uh, it means, um, it means that I, um, I love everyone, everyone. And, um, and mom, it, it means that everyone, um, everyone loves me. And I look at her and she looks at me and she sees I'm not really understanding it completely and she stares at the ceiling for a second and then she comes back to me with this light bulb face moment and she says, Mom, you know how everyone loves pizza? And I say, yeah. And she said, I'm, I'm like pizza. <laughs> I'm pizza, Mom. And I'm thinking, well, everyone doesn't love pizza. You know, I'm thinking like... No, you see, because there's people who are lactose intolerant and they can't eat the cheese, right? And there's people who are um, gluten-free and they can't eat the bread. And there's people who are just fucking intolerant and they... But I don't say that to her because I, I, I don't know how to explain that. And, um, and plus, it looks, like, it looks like Christmas morning on her face. And so I sit in her room and I just listen to her, her whole new vocabulary, you know, her, her new words of, of pansexual and pronouns, mom, and binders, mom, and boy jeans, mom, and testosterone, mom, and she's leaping for her next chapter and I'm searching for the pause button. I mean, I don't want to stop it. I just need to slow it down a little bit. But I know you can't stop the sun from rising. Everybody knows that. And as hard as it is to stand in this room in this conversation with her, I know it. I know that what she obviously doesn't know, which is um, it's going to be a thousand times harder to walk out the door with my son. So we just sit in the glow of this new discovery. And I try not to think about the thousands of borders that we have let yet to cross. There will be legal documents, name changes, conversations with the school, bathrooms to navigate, gym classes, and why do they still split up the, the boys' room, uh, the boys from the girls? I mean, isn't that sort of archaic at this point? There'll be conversations with my relatives, who will buy me every single book ever written about transgender. <laughs> And there'll be conversations with my relatives who, who will tell me that supporting my child is like signing a, co-signing a suicide note. And on family vacations, I will stop at a truck stop and watch my son walk into the men's room. And seconds will feel like years. And I'll wait outside and just pray that everyone in the bathroom happens to love pizza. And there'll be tearful moments at the DMV when after being shuttled from conversation to counter to conversation, we end up in front of this man who tells us that although we filled out all of the paperwork from the school and I feel like we've gotten everything checked, he says that my son will not be able to use his chosen name on his permit. And this is a big day, you know, the permit. It's like having freedom in your pocket. And he, he says he's going to have to leave here with the name Rosemary on his permit. And it should be okay. It's just temporary. And I look at my son from the corner of my eye and I see that he's sort of frozen in time and his eyes are wide and I look back at the man behind the counter and I can tell he doesn't get it and I'm feeling for him because you know the truth is sometimes I don't get it. I don't get what's the most important thing. I don't get what's the most valuable thing. I'm going to look at things from my spectrum not my child's and I don't always see it the way he does and I look back at my child and he's seems to have stopped breathing. And there's a moment that I, I know, I know that we, uh, we won't be able to walk out of the DMV with the name Rosemary on his permit. 
in the same way that I just can't eat the pussy. It's not personal. It's just a thing. So we'll leave there with no permit. And three years later, he still doesn't have a license. And he tells me that he's just afraid of driving. But I have a feeling that it's actually based on the fear of navigating a world with some tricky turns. And I watch him grow and sort of shed all those childish ways and fantasies of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny in a world where everyone loves pizza. And I console myself with masturbation and the recognition that it doesn't really matter what everyone else thinks. Because the truth is, like Ben's parents, I happen to love pizza. I love this little slice of pizza. And that is something that will never change, ever. Thank you. Mic drop. Thank you. I usually don't book speakers. One speaker, I find somebody and book them the next month as well. But at my, our last storytelling event, um, our next speaker uh, just got a, a rise out of so many people at the Zoom event because of what he had to say. Adam Hildreth is a Chicago, Chicago Renaissance man, a musician, spiritual guide, and 3D artist born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago. He first came out to his mother on National Coming Out Day, October 11, 1995. Adam is dedicated to developing his literary voice in effort to engage in activism for mental health awareness, especially relating to in indigenous and the LGBTQ plus community. He will be sharing his perspective, which illustrates the need for every person to discover and cultivate the, their light of truth within themselves and each bringing it forth in their own way. Would you please welcome Adam Hildreth? Thank you very much. Hold on. I'm a little tall. It's okay too. So, Maureen, just so you know, I've got my own fidget spinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was born in the late '70s in Highland Park, Illinois. Uh, you can tell I was born in the late '70s because I brought my dad jeans with me today. Yes. Um, I, I do identify now as Chicano. Um, up until very recently, I was identifying as mestizo, which means basically that you're half indigenous and, or, or at least somewhat indigenous and uh, the rest of you is European. And for a long time, that was perfectly fine for me. For a lot of people, that is where they are. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading lately, a lot of talking with people. And um, that term comes from a caste system that was used in New Spain, which is modern day Mexico now. And Mexico is still dealing with a lot of the institutionalized racism against indigenous peoples. Um, I, I have been delighted to watch my ancestry numbers change uh, as the science gets better, as more people are adding their genome to the project and realizing that I'm a lot more indigenous than I knew. Um, even those 
in my heart for my whole life I've known that I'm indigenous and so currently I use the term Chicano as somebody who is of Mexican descent born in the United States I hope that one day um, I have spent enough time and put enough sincere effort into engaging with the indigenous communities in this country and in the country of my grandparents and my father, um, that one day I may be able to call myself Masekwali, which is Nahuatl for indigenous person. And interestingly enough, Nahuatl is a language that is non-gendered. Um, and we find in many indigenous cultures in Mexico, um, there are still three genders. Um, to me, it's a beautiful thing. It's, and it's, it's kind of sad thing that it's been made to be invisible for so long. And the reason that I talk about this is not to change the conversation from one of gender, sexuality, identity, um, but it is to remain visible because there are a lot of people that have been invisible for a very long time. I've been one of them. I grew up in the suburbs, raised by my mom and my stepfather. Um, she married him when I was like three and a half. I was really excited to have a dad finally. I, other kids had them. I didn't know what that shit was all about. I don't know. It's a dad. Cool. I've got a dad. That went away very quickly because he didn't want to be a dad to a half-breed. He was a racist. He was um, schizophrenic. He was paranoid. He was bipolar and self-medicated with a raging case of alcoholism. He was a carpenter. And uh, you're talking early 80s. He lifted weights, had the tattoos. I just want to point out, there was a tattoo he had on his arm. And for the longest time, I didn't really understand what it was. It was ironic to me later as I got older and realized it was the eagle and the snake from the Mexican flag. He didn't know. <laughs> so. um, but he terrified me. For a long time, that eagle and that snake did not instill a sense of pride in me. It instilled a sense of terror in me because he was violent. And in my early life, I learned that the safest place for me often was in my bedroom or sometimes in my parents' bedroom with the lights off and the door closed, listening to all the things that were going on outside that door. Things that were probably better for me to see because as a child, see, I grew up uh, a little different from other kids. I just got diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, I'm 43. Uh, just two weeks ago, I finally got a doctor who listens to me. I'm not invisible anymore. I have ADHD. I also have PTSD. I have uh, major depressive disorder. I'm not saying this to you to gain sympathy from me. I'm saying it to you so that you understand these things should not be invisible. These things should be visible. We should honor these things. Many indigenous cultures talk about honoring a wound because the wound came from somewhere and you are keeping it for a reason. It's there to learn from. And so I honor my wounds by calling them out. At the time when I was young, I learned that being in a room somewhere, being invisible, being small, not being heard, not being seen, being like this a lot was safety. Visibility was vulnerability. Visibility was not safe. Uh, as I said, I wasn't like a lot of kids. I, uh, I was reading the Chicago Tribune by the time I was four. Um, we had a lot of books in my house that my mom would bring home from places and she was she, she taught me how to read, and it was, it was something that uh, I can remember, you know, just reading about animals and planets and all kinds of things. The natural world fascinated me. 
And we had a book on our shelf that was there as a way for us to learn about our bodies in a way that was written from the 1960s. So you're talking being in the 1980s, learning about stuff from the 1960s perspective when I, they didn't do science apparently. <laughs> uh, and, and they really didn't like people who were different back then. So I learned about sexual identity through the lens of it being a, homosexuality was like, a, it was a, a phase of heteronormative life. You, you like that guy, but you, you don't really like him. You, you just admire him and you, you want to be like him. You'll, you'll get over it. You, you'll marry a nice girl and, and retire to the suburbs and everything will be fantastic. It'll be swell. But I also grew up during the 80s in the suburbs. And that was a time when, even as a child, especially as a child who was as aware as I was, as young as I was, there were terrible things happening around me. I was hearing all the time when my parents would watch the news about the AIDS epidemic and the people who were dying from that in droves. It was also something that would show up on the sitcoms that we sat and got fed. Uh, don't watch TV, that shit rots your brain, people. But at the time, that was, a, that was some way that we could get some kind of education, except that it was always whitewashed. It was always turned into the kid down the street has HIV and you can hug him and it's okay and that's true. But we never heard of a story in a positive way about somebody who was gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. We never heard about them at all, except when the president would talk about the gay cancer. And so, so you know, this is a time when I was, I was a kid and this is the kind of signaling that I'm getting. Never mind that at the time, we didn't even really, like if you, were, you heard about gay or, or, or lesbian, there was a joke involved or there was a slur involved. Forget about being transgendered, forget about being bi, forget about being gender non-binary. None of that existed. You might as well be the two-third. The 80s in the suburbs were just about the same as the, the 60s in the suburbs from what I could understand. I mean, I wasn't there, but it was pretty much all about just fitting in and being like everybody else. And I'm telling you, I just found out I wasn't wired to be like everybody else. None of us are wired to be like everybody else. That's part of the beauty of it, right? So looking back at that time, even if I had known what I was about to go through, visibility wouldn't have even been viable. Because of the violence at home, by the time I was in fourth grade, I was in counseling. And this stuff was so awesome to me. I was like, yes, I could talk about my feelings and play with Play-Doh, this is great. And so I'd go, to, I'd go every week and I'd see Mrs. Miller and I'd be sitting there talking to her and I'd be like telling her all my stuff and everything like that and I, you know, I, I it was great. I, I was able to actually finally express things that were inside of me, these fears and these, these things that were happening at home that were terrifying to me, but I could express them. I could talk about them and I could do it in a safe space, right? So important. When I realized that being visible in that space that, that was visibility that was vital. It was vital to my survival. I got into middle school and a uh, very good friend of mine to this day um, was my music teacher at the time uh, in eighth grade, or actually sub sixth, seventh and eighth grade in middle school. Um, she, she asked me to join the choir. She asked me to try out for the choir, I did. And from that point on, I was like in love with like I learned about music and it was just like, oh, let me learn all about Schubert and Haydn and 
all these kinds of things and I'm gonna sing. And I, 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 I started singing, I started taking voice lessons, I started being classically trained. Uh, and, and I learned something, not just singing, but acting and doing visual arts. There was a space for me that I could be visible and be valued. And oh boy, did I run with that. When I went into high school, I was in all four years. I was in the fall play and the spring musical. By the time I was in my senior year, I was captain of the speech team two years in a row. I went to state for um, special occasion speech and original comedy. I just achieved, achieved, achieved. I was so involved. Part of that was because it was safer to be at school doing all those things than it was to be at home. And during this time was when I started having crushes on other boys. During this time was also when my stepfather's paranoia started to go in really, really bad. Um, I did a stupid thing. I had found uh, some of his copious collection of pornography and had not realized at the time that he had a cataloged like mind for this kind of thing. And so he knew what was missing from his stash. I came home one day from, from school in junior high and he had taken my entire room and thrown it everywhere. He was sitting in his rocking chair and he would sit in rocking. And he had my journal in his hand. There were no real good boundaries in my house, but that's when they were totally erased. I was visible in a way that I never wanted to be, and no one ever should be. But that's when they found out the first time. That wasn't a good thing. I started to share my experiences through public speaking. There's a, a I, I think the organization is still around. It's called Operation Snowball. It's through the Illinois Alcohol and Drug Dependence Association. Um, an amazing organization saved my life and it also provided me a vehicle to be visible because what I found is through sharing things through the small groups uh, and, and the, the friendships that I formed in that uh, organization um, it gave me strength to talk more about what was happening to the point where I actually started doing public speaking for that organization junior year of high school this is uh, 1993 early in the summer um, by that point, uh, Steve's mental illness had gone off the rails. Um, he was, he had already, um, he had already, back in junior high, he had already killed a kitten of mine. Um, and that summer, over a very short discussion about a hat that I had brought back from the Renaissance Fair and was wandering around at home wearing. I defied him and wouldn't take it off. And, and then uh, it resulted eventually in over a period of maybe about half an hour uh, of him attempting to take my life. I didn't look at it like that back then. You understand? Like I, I didn't see myself. I didn't understand that what was happening to me then was not just a fight or being beaten up. It was a person who was insane choking me out. It was watching the black go toward the edges of my vision. Somebody who should have kept me safe was trying to kill me. mom came home she said I've called the police get your shit get ready they're on their way over and he was already at the point where he had taken a shower waiting for them to come by the time they were there he said he called me an asshole and she turned and she said that's because that's what you are well they were gonna get divorced that lasted about I don't know Felt like a few months maybe that fall he ended up taking his own life that was my second exposure to suicide um the first one where it was so 
personal and direct. I used that platform to speak about what was going on, to speak about what had happened to me, to let people know that I was not going to let that defeat my inner spirit, that I still was able to find support around me, to have a family that I could create and be myself. And I let my freak flag fly back then. Let me tell you, you're talking about like the, the mid nineties. And it was like, I just, I was as colorful and as loud as I could be. And, and, and I came out to that crowd and there's my sister in the crowd going, it's just a phase, I swear. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and my sister is uh, one of my biggest cheerleaders these days. So um, that has changed too. But, you know, I, I still continued to speak through that organization. And I, I came out and I was out in my life. And, you know, my mom, when I finally did come out to her, she had told me originally, you know, I don't accept this. I, 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 I don't understand it. I think it's a disease. And uh, just like any other mental disorder, and I, I don't accept it. Um, but you're my son and I love you. And I always felt like, like there was context there somehow, like you're my son, so I have to love you. And I know that that's not what my mom meant. Um, we've had a long journey. And, and again, the parents have their own coming out story and they have their own process. And it, it, it's hard to respect that when you're in the middle of your own process and you, you don't see eye to eye. Like, like you said, I and mean, you guys have said so eloquently, that, you know, you're in your place and you're thinking about it one way and, and it's a totally different set of experiences. So my mom would continue to say things like, you know, I know you're gay, but like you and so-and-so, you'd make beautiful children this way. Just, just, just say. but I wouldn't be able to hold hands with my boyfriends if I ever brought them over to her house in, in front of my brothers. I, I, don't, I don't know, to this day, I don't, sh I don't think she really like can justify it. Like, it's like, were you afraid that they were gonna catch the gay? Like, I don't know. Um, I was in the working world. By that point I was doing, you know, I, I had already started a couple of different careers and uh, there were some jobs that I had where it was okay to be out. Um, as long as you were out just like everybody else was out, you had to be a certain type of gay, I guess. Other jobs, it was not even physically safe to let people know who I was. I heard a lot of, you know, you're talking late 90s, early aughts. So there was a lot of, you know, oh, I totally like, I, you, if you're gay, it's cool. I'm cool with that, you know, just as long as you don't like, you know, put it in my face or anything. And I'm like, put what in your face? Like I have like this, this gay, into, like my gaydar is going to hit you if I get too close. Um, so, I, you know, at that point, I kind of was like, okay, I'm just gonna be quiet about it. And, and, and I started to learn that visible wasn't always viable. It, it was only conditionally viable. You fast forward a couple of years, it's the first time I was, I was sexually assaulted and, and it happened in my adult life at a party with people I thought I should have been able to trust. Um, and, and a friend had invited me over to this friend's party and it was the friend who, who did this. Um, and I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't tell anybody about it because why? Because who's going to believe that a grown man was sexually assaulted? It doesn't matter that, I mean, I was completely drunk and in no way in control of my own body and that he took advantage of. I couldn't tell anyone. No one would believe me. So on goes the cloak of invisibility. When social media started to take off uh, around like 2012, I noticed everybody was doing this and I started to being, having the kind of brain that I have, I started to put two and two together and go, this is not gonna end up being a great thing. Everybody's into this right now, but something, something is not right here. I was already starting to, because at that point I had kind of withdrawn. I, I had stayed quiet. Um, in the words of Brene Brown, I, I stayed deliberately small. 
so that no one could see me, so that no one would know who I was. And, and even though I, I, was, I was not quite at the point yet, um, a few years later, I would, I would be introducing myself at work being like, hi, I'm Adam and I'm gay as hell. Um, some people thought that was cool. Other people were like, really? Whatever. But, you know, to each their own, I guess. So, um, I, I was in jobs that I probably shouldn't have been in for my brain type. And I met somebody at work uh, who sexually assaulted me in my own home. Because again, my trust meter was way off. And I, again, I had pushed myself down so much that I couldn't even see myself. So the idea of this was like, okay, it happened. And again, what am I gonna do? Tell somebody who's gonna believe me. Everybody at work knows him. Nobody at work really knows me. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna believe me. Nobody will see me anyway. So I really withdrew. That's when I started just, I, I had already uh, been involved in playing online uh, games like online role-playing games and stuff, and that was kind of my escape. It was a place where I could be whatever I wanted to be. I could, I've, I've met a ton of people like, look, people make fun of Second Life, but I'll tell you what, you, you learn so many things when you're in, in the virtual environment where people can be whatever they want to be, and they present themselves as they truly are inside with whatever they, they make themselves out to be. It's, it's, it can be a very, a thing that's very fraught with a lot of psychology, but but it can also be a beautiful experience because you, you can get to know certain people for who they really feel that they are and they're expressing that and they're feeling good about expressing that. It's beautiful. Um, but but I, I still was a couple of layers behind something else and, and wasn't ready for people to see me. It wasn't until I really needed to, to, to get some therapy and get some help. I finally, finally, after years of trying, um, and not being heard, I finally got hooked up with a therapist who was starting to give me some things to look at. And she had me look at Brene Brown's um, uh, TED Talk on vulnerability and like crazy. Um, I sat there and like heard myself and her words and I, I realized something at the time. And, and visibility was gonna mean vulnerability, yeah. But vulnerability can lead to creativity. And that leads to connection, which is really what we are here for. Throughout therapy, I was trying to learn self-compassion, um, still never really had an idea of who I was. Um, had kind of forgotten it. And at the end of last year in November, I had a couple of personal traumas, um, another suicide, um, and the death of a work mentor. Uh, at the end of the year. Didn't really have a lot of time to grieve. Had to get back in the saddle, had to work. Had a friend who um, has her new organs now, thank God. Uh, but at the time was dealing with kidney failure. And so I was her person to take her back and forth. I, I was doing a lot of being there for other people. I was singing at the funeral here and visiting the funeral over here and taking my friend up here on my birthday, like being at the hospital with all the stuff and the things. And I, I, I don't regret any of that, but one part. And that is I chose not to see me during any of that. And because I also I'm right now trying to get a diagnosis for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It's a hard thing to get a diagnosis for, if any of you have heard about it. Um, it it's one of those things that's very dicey. So I don't say that I have it, but we're, we're getting pretty close. So um, one of the things that happens with that is you, it's like a lot of pain, and it can be very unpredictable. And with PTSD, there can be a lot of unpredicted pain that can happen. Things can happen to you because your brain is telling your body you're in a situation. So in February, the stress ended up putting me to the point where I was using a walker. Um, 
for three weeks, I was using a walker just to get to the bathroom. And most of the time, I didn't really make it all the way. That was at the end of February and the beginning of March, and we all know what happened then. So here I was, once again, alone, disconnected from everything, totally and utterly invisible, because I left my job, because I didn't feel safe working in the healthcare environment that I was working in. Um, and here I was, just sitting in my house, chilling. Then I started to check some stuff out on Facebook and see some other people out there. And I saw some things happening in the world earlier this year that were like, what? People are actually engaging in a positive way. They're actually like being kind to each other and they're encouraging each other and they're being creative and they're contributing to the happiness and well-being of each other, trying to comfort each other, trying to be a safe space for each other. What is going on here? So I took a chance and I recorded a video of me singing a song. And then I started to write poetry. And then I started to study the language of Nahuatl. And I started to, you guys, like I was doing visual arts. I was doing getting back into my 3D art again. I was, um, I made a kilt, y'all. Like, do you know, do you know how, how, how difficult it is to sew a kilt and then do it without a pattern? But that's the kind of charge I was getting from the feedback and the support and the care that was happening at the beginning of this year when all of this stuff started, when all of this stuff started. I wasn't invisible anymore. There were people that are like, where have you been? And I'm like, I don't know, where have I been? What I realized then was that vulnerability engendered by visibility is necessary for our survival and our personal evolution. I'm gonna say that again. The vulnerability engendered by visibility is necessary for our survival and for our personal evolution. And I realized I cannot keep this to myself. COVID gave me time to think a lot about my voice, about how I use it, how I used to use it, how I haven't been using it, and how I need to use it. It is a gift from God in whatever way I choose to use it. It gave me time to be thankful for my faith community. Shout out to St. Nicholas St. Episcopal Church in Elk Grove, Illinois. Also gave me pause for those that are out there that are still struggling to be seen in the first place. Black, brown, trans, the elderly LGBTQ community, people of every single stripe of our spectrum because make no mistake, that rainbow flag over there is based on a spectrum. And that's what we are. Like I, I happen to know a little bit of a thing about a spectrum. A couple of them. And I've heard that word more than once tonight, I think. See, there are some out there that visibility is still not a viable thing for them. Um, and I personally believe that we are all one consciousness, desperately trying to understand itself through the points different physical points in space-time. That's what we are. Different physical points in space-time, but we're all the same, same thing. There's so much of it, we just can't experience it all at once from one point of view. It's too beautiful, it's too big. But with that, I'm gonna beg you to think about it and to, if you, if you are visible already in your life in some way, then stay visible. 
stay visible. If you are not visible and you feel like it's, it's getting time and you have the support around you that you need to get visible, then do it. Waste no time. Get visible. Now is the time to be visible, to be heard, to be vocal. You need to be visible for the you that is not physically you right now, for the you that might be in the past, still struggling to be the you that's today. Or the you that's across the planet in a place where they don't even acknowledge that we exist. That person does not feel safe being visible and they might see something that you create or that you say or that you do that will bring them a light of hope inside. You bring your light of truth to them, to them, to us, you will give somebody hope to find their own light, hold on to it and guide themselves through some dark times. Be visible for those people. Visibility leads to vulnerability, yep. And vulnerability can lead to powerful change through creativity and through connection. And that is power. Connection is power. Stan Lee said, with great power comes great responsibility. So, be visible, be vocal, do not ever give up, ever. Because you're lovable, you're capable, and worthy of using your voice and your talent and your inner light. The world needs it right now more than ever. So don't ever forget that. Let that light of inner truth shine. Be visible. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I want to thank all the speakers for sharing your journey with us this evening. I want to thank all of you attending the event, either live or by Zoom or Facebook. Please visit our website. Our address is outwords, O-U-T-W-O-R-D-S dot org, or visit us on Facebook. In the next couple of days, there will be posting the date of our next event. And I want to thank you for being here. Good night.